Father, we come to you again here on this Lord's Day to once again continue to worship you and give the honor and praise that you're, you're due. We thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus. We saw there in uh, early service, the morning service there, on how that um, Jesus is the Son of God. He is God. He's Lord. He's, he's Savior. He's the Creator. He's the King. He's the Great I Am. He's the He's just so much, Lord, that, that um, He deserves deserves all. That you know, we we often neglect Him and don't give Him His rightly due. And that uh, without Jesus, we'd be doomed and on a, on a path to the lake of fire for all eternity. So, Father, I do pray that that there's someone out there that's not saved. That today might be the day they get convicted and that they realize that they're a sinner in need of a Savior and they turn to Jesus and get saved. Again, we pray for Jesus, who is the great judge, to bring justice to this sin, sin, sinful, sick world that's uh, so corrupt that, that, that there is no justice in it anymore. And so that he'll bring justice where wrong has been done. We pray, Lord, that that um, put that hedge around us, keep us all healthy and safe, protect us, keep the fiery darts of Satan at bay. And we just pray, Lord, that... You might bless the ministry, allow, uh, many books to get sold and to just uh, be able to get the tracks out and just get the things done that the people might be able to get saved. And Father, we just pray that you'll bless this service. Just be with those that are here and listening online. Again, bring with those missionaries and preachers and that are making a stand for you in the King James Bible and just all people, regardless of who they are, that you know, like Brandon Peterson and, you know, the things you've been showing him with with uh, the number patterns and so forth, the number seven and things, and and that his Truth is Christ YouTube channel that and others that are out there, you know, trying to show the truth that, that things might be known. And so, Father, we just pray that you'll bless this service because we know that things are coming about soon of what, what's going on here, that the days are, are coming short with, with uh, things going on in Israel that it's not going to be long, I don't think, before the, the battle of Gog and Magog. And I'm not saying it's going to be coming today, tomorrow, next week. But, you know, within a few years, anyway, all these things, I think, are going to start going to start coming into play. And so, Father, we just pray that you'll bless this service, be with this sermon, give me the words, and have the hearts and minds open to hear the word. And we thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, this, we're going to be continuing our study in Revelation. This will be Revelation part 82. Now, before we move on, we had, had finished looking at uh, Revelation chapter 12. But before we move on to 13, I want to go back and look at a couple things that, uh, you know, I mentioned there in Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, where it speaks of the eagle's wings. You know, and I, I picked this up in my study during the week that, you um, you know, Re Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, it says, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nursed for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Now, we already mentioned the serpents, the Satan, and that, you know, the, the time, times, and half a time, that's your three and a half years. That's the end of the tribulation, the second half, the great tribulation, whatever you want to call it. We already said the woman's Israel and so forth. And then we said, you know, we didn't know if, this, if if Israel was going to be supernaturally transplanted to uh, what many believe would be Petra or wherever God's going to put her and or things like that. You know, that, that's why I was describing the wings. Or was she going to be, you know, actually having to do some physical travel, you know, whether it's flying or, you know, driving vehicles in a convoy or walking or doing whatever because that we didn't know. And I said, well, I actually thought that it sounded like, they weren't necessarily going to be moved supernaturally that they were going to have to actually do some physical traveling, but God would supernaturally protect them. Because remember I said that it talked about the woman, you know, you know, woe unto the woman that being be with child and so forth. Well, what would really matter if I had child, if God's just going to supernaturally move me to wherever. So, you know, I said, I believe that, but I saw, um, I want to take a look at Exodus chapter 19, verse four, it seems to show that the Israelites will probably not be supernaturally transported, but rather they'll just be protected. You know, and they'll probably be eat manna again in, in, uh, 
in, during their travel and in Petra. So during, you know, remember they had manna for that 40 years there in the wilderness after they left Egypt. And that, um, you know, that's angel's food. You know, so once they finally get to Petra, more than likely that's probably what they'll end up eating again. It's got to just give them, you know, manna. You know, people said that and I, it makes sense that, you know, can't 100% say scripture says that, but it just makes sense. And during their travel, if they actually have to do physical travel, they probably do the same thing. Because remember, he even said, don't even go into the house and get clothes or do nothing, you know. So obviously, you're not going to go around getting food. You know, they're not going to have anything. What you have, so, you know, God would have to provide for them just like he did when they had to hurry up and get out of Egypt. But there in um, Exodus chapter 19, verse 4, it says, you know, this is, talking about the after they were in the the Israelites when they were in, in Egypt there back in verse one it says in the third month and the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai so they're still out there you know this is in the the third month after they had shortly left Egypt but then verse four says ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you out on eagles wings and brought you unto myself you know and we know when they left Egypt, they physically marched, you know, and, and, and moved. You know, they had a few animals, maybe a few people might have got some of the children or something. But basically, they were walking. And then they, they walked across the Red Sea when God parted it. And then they kept on walking down there. And it says they wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years. You know, we know that. But it said that their shoes didn't even wear out and so forth because God protected even their clothing. They didn't have to worry about That's why I said you didn't have to worry about go grabbing any more clothes because God will supernaturally protect them and he would supernaturally wash them or do whatever so they don't stink or something or whatever, you know, but they're not going to get holes in them and all that type of stuff. But they, you know, it says, it describes that uses that same terminology here where they're talking about being on Eagle's wings, but they weren't, you know, necessarily supernaturally, you know, God didn't transport them from Egypt and then all of a sudden, boom, they're in the wilderness or whatever, you know, that they, they had to actually physically travel. And so my thing is, you know, it's kind of that same terminology that we see there in Revelation. And so I would say, that they're probably going to have to do some physical travel, which is, again, why I said that they, um, you know, it describes, you know, about, you know, what was, you know, the woman that's in labor, I mean, with child and so forth. Because as I said, again, what difference would it make if I'm pregnant or if I have a child, even if it's just a young child or whatever, what difference does any of that make if, you know, if uh, I'm going to be super now, or even, even like, you know, you know, it warns them, you know, if you're on the housetop, I said, don't go down the house. If you're in the field, don't go back to the house, just run. Well, why would he tell you to run? Or why would you even worry about, you know, you wouldn't even have to worry about going back in the house because automatically you just, they like be transported, like poof, you're just gone, you know, then you'd go off to wherever. So to me, it makes sense that they have to do some physical travel, which is why he tried, you know, remember Satan says he tried to throw out that flood of water out of his mouth that again, why would you try, you you, know, you won't be trying to flood something that it's supernaturally got moved. And, you know, like I said, he certainly isn't going to be able to do anything there at Petra. And there isn't even any water around there. So, it's you know, that's why it would have to be, as I said, I think it literally comes out of his mouth. But it's still, I, I just think that they're probably actually doing something. But I also, before we move on, I wanted to, uh, I said I wanted to look at this, but we didn't have time last week because it's going to take a little while. But I said that Tim LaHaye, you know, he, he had once compared Jesus Christ and, and the Antichrist. Now, Tim LaHaye, if people don't know who he is, you know, obviously he was a pastor. He was a theologian and, you know, he, he, he's dead now. But, you know, he uh, he's the one that was behind the Left Behind books, which I'm sure people have heard of. Whatever. Now, I'm not saying I always agree with everything or this or that, but that's not the point. The point is he made this comparison here between Jesus Christ and the Antichrist. And I thought it was kind of relevant since we were looking at uh, the Antichrist last week a little bit and, and so forth that, uh, you know, we said we saw there that it was in, in Revelation. We, we started looking at chapter 13, verse 1 and so forth. And so, um, you know, because we had seen where, you know, we'll look at it again next week because I don't know if we'll get to it or not today. But that how remember how they had changed in verse 1. That from John to Dragon and so forth, and the Disney making sense with the, the matchup with first two and so forth. But his, his comparison, I want to take a look at this. And like I said, it might take the rest of the time. I don't know. We'll see. Cause I want to actually look up these verses. But uh, 
Tim LaHaye, he said that Christ came from above, which that gets that from John chapter 6, verse 38. And like I said, I want to go through all these different verses because I think it's important to see some of this stuff that, you know, people aren't just making this stuff up, that you get this stuff from Scripture. So, you know, that God, God himself shows us the comparison. So, you know, in John chapter 6, verse 38, this is Jesus himself talking. And he says, for I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. So he says, I came down from heaven. So we know that heaven is above. You know, if you're coming down, you obviously have to be above, you know. So, you know, you're, um, Jesus came from above. While the Antichrist comes from the pit. Look at Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. You know, we saw a little bit of this here. But um, Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. Of course, the pit, you know, let's talk about the bottomless pit, which is, remember, that's a part of hell. You know, the bottomless pit, it's it's like the the worst part of hell. That's where the, the angels that made it with the, the the women that produced the giants there in Genesis chapter 6. That's where they got sent to and so forth. But Revelation chapter 11, verse uh, 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. You know, and we know through all out of Revelation, you know, the beast is the Antichrist here. And, you know, he tries to make war against all of those who, you know, whether it's Israelites or the, um, you know, of course, see this here, we know this, because remember this here, this right here. This is the Antichrist. This is right after, remember, he had gotten killed. Uh, this is the, the two prophets were, um, or, or rather, the, 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 sorry, the two prophets, had been, you know, the two witnesses had been killed. And then, you know, it says here that now, you know, the Antichrist, it says right here, he's the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. And as I said, you know, we know that the beast throughout the rest of Scripture, you know, it's talking about the Antichrist. You know, that's the term that John uses in Revelation. You know, he only uses that in 1 John and 2 John. We're actually called him the Antichrist. You know, here he's called the, the, the beast. It says he came from the bottomless pit. You know, remember, his, his dad is actually Satan himself, you know. So, so we see the difference. One comes from hell. The other one comes from heaven. Now, Christ came in his Father's name. Look at John chapter 5, verse 4 to 3. So John chapter 5, verse 4 to 3. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. You know, and that, and, and that same verse, is, like I said, shows that the Antichrist will come in his own name. So, so Jesus came... Jesus Christ came in his Father's name, while the Antichrist will come in his own name. You know, and we see that, you know, it says there, I am coming in my Father's name, and, re and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. You know, so people will gobble up the, the, uh, the Antichrist who comes in his own name, but yet Jesus who came in the, you know, God the Father's name, then they rejected him. Now Christ humbled himself. We're going to see that in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. Well, Antichrist will exalt himself. So look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. General Electric Power Company, you know, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, or um, go eat popcorn, I've heard others call it too, you know, if you want to try to remember. <laughs> but, uh,. <clears throat> so look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So see here, Jesus Christ, he humbled himself. But now the Antichrist is going to exalt himself. We'll see that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4. In 
2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4. Right before 1 Timothy. And so 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. You know, this is when he's going to desecrate the temple. You know, he's going to sit in there and complain, uh, proclaim himself as God. And, you know, he exalts says himself. He exalts himself above that all that is called God. So anything, you know, people that if you worship the true God now or you were anything that you called God, you know, even the Buddhists or anybody else, you know, somebody, you know, these other false religions, Islam, you know, Allah or something, he's going to say, no, none of those things are God. I am God. You know, he's going to exalt himself. Whereas Jesus humbled himself, you know, so we see the difference there. That Remember Jesus, he became the servant, you know, he went and washed his disciples' feet, whereas they should have been washing his feet. But yet, you know, he washed his, you know, he humbled himself. Uh, Moses, who was the great type of Jesus, you know, he was a great man of, you know, God, you know, he humbled himself, you know, was known for his humbleness. But yet the Antichrist, he's just the opposite. You know, we see that that's that's how Satan is. You know, he's the opposite of, of everything. You know, uh, God is good. Satan is evil. You know, that there, there's, you know, God is, we saw that this morning that Jesus is the truth. Satan's lies, you know. You know, I didn't even include those things in here, but I mean, the Antichrist, as I said, as a child, him, I mean, everything on him is a lie, too. So, But Christ was despised. Look at Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3. Remember, this is the one where they, uh, the Jews are not allowed to read this. So Isaiah, this chapter, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3, which is exactly the reason why. I don't know why they don't read it. You know, that's usually what a kid does. They say, you know, kids stay away from drugs or do this, that. And they'll always go and do what you tell them not to do. You would think the Jews would be the same thing. Like, well, why I can I not read this book? You know, it's in, it's in Scripture. But Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3, it says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. And he was despised, and we esteemed him not. You know, and then also in Luke chapter 23, verse 18, we see the same thing. But see, he, you know, he's despised. Remember, he was spit upon and, and, and all these kind of things. So Luke chapter 23, verse 18. So Luke chapter 23, verse 18. And they cried out all at once, saying, that's the wrong verse. Away with this man and release unto us uh, Barabbas. Well, not really. No, I see. Okay, I, I see what I'm doing here. But they're saying, away with this man and release unto us Barabbas. You know, he was despised. That they're saying, we don't want this man, Jesus Christ. We want we want Barabbas. You know, remember, it tells us if you read on that Barabbas, or even verse 19 it says, who for certain sedition made in the city and for murder was cast into prison. So, you know, sedition, that means a rebellion. That's It's like a, a rebellion against the government. Uh, a rioting, you know, that type of thing. And, um, you know, he was guilty of that and murder, and yet they wanted to keep him, and they despised Jesus and got rid of him, you know, that they wanted him to get crucified. Now, the Antichrist is going to be admired. So, you know, Christ, Jesus Christ was despised, but yet the Antichrist will be admired. Look at Revelation chapter 13, verses 3 and 4. Revelation chapter 13, Verses three and four. You know, we'll look at this again next week. But and I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, "Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him?" You know, so, you know, it says they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast. So here they are, you know, it says all the world wondered after the beast. You know, they they, they were amazed. They, 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 uh, it says they all worship the beast. But yet Jesus was despised. You know, they're like crucify. Remember, they were yelling out, crucify him, crucify him. But yet the Antichrist, they're all going to be worshiping him. You know, but yet they should have been worshiping Jesus Christ, who was their creator. 
Now Christ will be exalted. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. Yeah, we saw he was humbled in verse 8 and then verse 9, but he's going to get exalted now. You know, we're going to see the opposite. You know, he starts out humbled, then he gets exalted. So, wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And then verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and that things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, so he got, he's, the first time he was humbled. Then now he's going to get exalted. One day, you know, everybody, including Satan himself, will bow down the knee and declare Jesus is God, is Lord. And now the Antichrist, you know, remember, he, he was, first he was exalted, but now he will be cast into the lake of fire. Look at Isaiah chapter 14, verses 14 and 15. So Isaiah chapter 14, verses 14 and 15. You know, of course, this is talking about Satan here, but remember, the Antichrist, his dad is Satan, so, you know, it's still, and he represents him, he's definitely a type of him and everything, but uh, 14 and 15 of Isaiah 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit, and remember, we already said that the, the pit was the bottomless pit, you know, it's, we know right there, it tells us that Satan's going get, to get sent down to the bottomless pit, or which is a part of hell, which we then which we know that in Revelation, you know, he's going to get cast into the bottomless pit. And then look at uh, Revelation chapter, uh, uh, Revelation chapter nineteen verse twenty. Revelation chapter nineteen verse twenty. Well, before we go to, well, let's go ahead and read that first. Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth. Remember, the beast, the Antichrist. And their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against. Revelation 19, 20. Revelation 19, 20. Well, yeah, 19. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet, the first 20, Revelation 19, 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. You know, they get cast alive. You know, people, and the thing is, you know, we know later on when Satan gets, gets cast in there, a thousand years later, they're still alive. You know, that's what it says. It says where they are. You know, although Bibles will try to say where they were, you know, trying to support annihilation and that type of stuff. You know, that's why I said one word, little things that they go and change in these modern Bibles it can make a big difference. You know, it supports all these false doctrines. You know, changing are to were, then uh, look at this first Revelation chapter 20. Then look at um, verse 2. This is where it can get passed in the uh well, verse 3, well, verse 2 and 3, Revelation 20, verse 2, And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till a thousand years should be filled. And after that, it must be loosed a little season. You know, we just saw that in Isaiah, where he's going to get cast down in the pit. Well, here now we, we see it's getting cast down in the bottomless pit. You know, so we know they're the same. We know it's also hell, because it told us that there. And so, uh, you know, that's where he's getting cast in there. But then we see there in verse 10, Revelation 20, verse 10, after this thousand years, he comes out a little bit, tries to play his game with God, and God says, all right, I'm done with you now. So now you're going into lake of fire for all eternity. So verse 10, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. You know, and it, it doesn't say even will be because remember God's eyes, the future's already, you know, it's already happened to him. So that, that's where they're, and in God's eyes, they're already there, you know, and so forth. But it says where they are, 
you know, they're still alive after this thousand years. They don't get annihilated. You know, people talk about all this stuff. And, um, you know, like I said, they'll make the changes where those things say things like where the pro uh, false prophet and uh, the beast and the false prophet were. Well, that's like they get they get annihilated. You know, it's, it's that promoting all that false teaching. And so, you know, that one little word there makes a big difference and so forth. So he's going to end up getting um, humbled. You know, he starts out exalted. He gets humbled, whereas Jesus starts out humbled and gets exalted. Uh, let's try to get through these things here. Now, Christ came to do his Father's will. Look at John chapter 6, verse 38. So John chapter 6, verse 38. So we've got quite a few more here. I'm going to try to get done, but we'll get to more. <clears throat> John chapter 6, verse 38. John chapter 6 and verse 38. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. So again, we also see he came down from heaven. You know, so he came, remember, he came from above. But he, um, you know, we read that earlier. But, you know, he came to do his father's will. You know, and this is the father's will which hath sent me. You know, so it tells you in verse 39. And then, uh, whereas I said, the Antichrist came to do his own will. Look at Daniel chapter 11, verse 36. Daniel chapter 11, <laughs> verse 36. Daniel chapter 11, verse 36. Daniel chapter 11, verse 36. And the king shall do according to his, to his will. Now, let's just talk about the Antichrist here. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. You know, again, so it also sees there where he's exalting himself above all the gods you know, all the false gods and, you know, and even including God says, you know, and speaks marvelous things against the God of gods. And so even against the true God, you know, he tries to elevate himself, you know, so we see him exalting himself. And, um, you know, he, but it, the point was the very, for this one, in the very beginning, that he was doing according to his will, whereas Jesus came to do the Father's will. The Antichrist came to do his own will. Now, Christ came to save. Look at Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. You know, I think people need to look at some of this stuff, too, like when they vote for certain politicians. You'll find out that uh, they're not who they really say they are. You know, they change their tune a little bit. So Luke chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. You know, that was his purpose. You know, the first coming was to come and, and save those that were lost. Now, obviously, all of us are lost. We're born with sin nature. You know, then, that's why we need to get saved. And once you're saved, you're not lost. And now the Antichrist will come to destroy. Look at Daniel chapter 8, verse 24. So Daniel chapter 8, verse 24. So Daniel chapter 8, verse 24. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Twice in that verse, it's Daniel chapter 8, verse 24. So twice, you know, it says, he shall destroy wonderfully, and then it says, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. So, you know, we see that, Jesus came to save, but the Antichrist, he comes to destroy. Remember, he ends up bringing, we see there in, one of, you know, in the Revelation, he brings war and everything else. God tries to come and bring peace. Now, Christ is the good shepherd. We saw this this morning. You know, I'm not going to uh, read all of it, but we'll look at uh, John chapter 10. You know, it's 1 through 15, talks about the whole thing. We're not going to read through all those verses, but John chapter 10. We're just going to read again that he's by the good shepherd. So, But, you know, John, read that sometime on your own. John chapter 10, the first 15 verses, 1 through 15. 
how, you know, if you come in by any other way than Jesus, you know, you're a robber, you know, things like that. But, you know, we saw that this morning in verse 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And then verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and I know one of mine. You know, as the Father, verse 15, as the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. So we see that, uh, you know, he's the good shepherd. Whereas the Antichrist is the idle shepherd. Look at Zechariah chapter 11, verses 16 and 17. Zechariah chapter 11, verses 16 and 17. And we're going to look at two more verses after this, and then we're going to close it for this week. But, so, um, Zechariah chapter 11, verses 16 and 17. For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land, which shall not visit those that be cut off. Neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that, that that is broken, nor feed that that standeth still. But he shall eat the flesh of the fat, and tear the cl their claws in pieces. Verse 17, that's what we're looking for. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. You know, and look at verse 15 too. And the Lord said unto me, Take unto thee yet the instruments of a foolish shepherd. You know, people are foolish that follow the Antichrist, the beast. You know, he's the idle shepherd. You know, he it says, Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. You know, he Satan does that all the time now. Even ones that flat out openly worship Satan. Boy, he'll, he'll throw them under the rug in, in a heartbeat. You know, that he leaves his own people. You know, he, he whereas, uh, you know, Jesus doesn't do that. You know, we saw that he was the good shepherd. That, you know, he, remember we said so this morning that he knows the, his own sheep by, you know, his by their name. And they, they call him, you know, they call him, you know, he calls us by our name and, and they call him. They know, they know Jesus. They know their shepherd. Now, I want to close with this. That in John chapter 15, 1, Christ is the true vine. You know, we saw that this morning too, but I want to quickly see the comparison here that of uh, Jesus Christ and the Antichrist. So John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. You know, then again there in verse 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. So, you know, we see there, you know, that Jesus, he is the true vine. Because, you know, remember, it's... He, he notice he says true vine because Satan always tries to copy everything Jesus does. That's why we have all these, these copycats or, or whatever. But look at Revelation chapter 14, verse 18 and 19. We're going to see that the Antichrist is the vine of the earth. So he's the vine of the earth. You know, coming from the earth, that's not a good thing. You know, remember, Jesus came from above. You know, he's that true vine. Whereas you know, what does the earth produce? We have um, thorns and thistles and weeds and so forth like that, you know, because of sin. You know, it doesn't bring forth the good fruit. You know, the, it, it, uh, the good fruit comes from Jesus. So, you know, he's that true vine. You know, look at Revelation chapter 14, verses 18 and 19. Revelation chapter 14, verses 18 and 19. You know, and remember, one of, what, what does a vine produce? You know, we're talking about in scripture, you know, there are some things that come off the vine, but in scripture, it's always talking about grapes. And we're going to see that, that here, you know, what, what, what can be used, you know, obviously you get grape juice from it, but people often use grapes for evil purposes to make wine so they can get drunk. And that's what we're going to see here. Look at verse Revelation chapter 14, verse 18, 19. Another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. See, again, it's showing you that the vine is always grapes. And the angel, now I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with grapes, but when they get used for wrong purposes, such as the wine, so they get drunk. And then look at us here. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth. See, obviously, if you read other places, the, the, the sickle, the angel comes in there to gather. He's gathering these things. You know, the earth, but, you know, if you go back and look at like verses 15, 14, 16 and stuff, 
then you know the angel he he with the sickle he's reaping the earth you know in other words he's getting rid of all these unsaved he's getting rid of all the bad things and so we see here it says that he takes this thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth so obviously if he's gathering this vine of the earth it was not a good thing and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God and the wine press was trodden without the city and blood came out of the wine press even under the horse brides horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs you know so we see that God takes and he stomps it he you know he turns it in his own wine press and he he destroys the the antichrist you know he's gonna you know the, the, the you know what he represents but I mean you know like I said there's other things we as I mentioned you know like Jesus you know we saw that he's the truth where it's Satan you know he's uh, the antichrist he's always lies he blasphemies God whereas the um, Jesus, you know, he, you know, he, he praised, you know, God the Father, you know, he, he prayed to him and all this kind of gave him glory. Whereas the Antichrist, you know, blasphemies God. So you know, we see the difference. There's other things that could be added in here as well. But you get get the point. But like I said, I knew that would take a while. But anyway, we're already over time. So we'll pick it up next week, uh, looking at verse 13 too. Uh, probably review a little bit of verse first, but. So Revelation chapter 13, verse 2 is where we'll pick it up and we'll continue on. But I wanted, I th thought it was important to have that comparison since we were kind of talking about the Antichrist and so forth because so many people miss a lot of this stuff and it's, it's important to show the scripture because so many people that, you know, there's so many wrong ideas going around and and so forth. And and so we need to show, you know, what what's the truth and not just, you know, somebody's opinion or something like that. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time you've given us here to once again study your word. We thank you for you show us these things. We thank you that, that Jesus is the true Christ, that, that we know that the Antichrist is going to be coming. It's, I mean, look at his very name. He's the beast. You know, I mean, it, it, uh, you want to worship the beast or do you want to worship the son of God? And uh, that's a choice that everyone's going to have to make it one day soon. And for those who make the wrong choice, if you choose the beast, you will spend eternity with him in the lake of fire. So I would recommend you choose Jesus, who's the Son of God, and spend eternity with him in heaven. And so, Father, we just pray that you'll bless the rest of the week and allow for a safe return for the midweek service. We just pray that you be with each and every one. Just bless us all, keep us all healthy and safe. And again, just bring justice where wrong's been done. And just uh, pray for this nation, pray for the people to turn from their wickedness. Pray that today might be the day of salvation for many, that many might get saved. We just pray, Lord, that you continue to look after us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.